I want you to take a moment and try to recall in your mind the last time you had the flu, that you were sick. I can see by your faces. You felt horrible. You felt really, really bad. You felt tired, exhausted, pain everywhere, headache. You didn't want to eat. You didn't want to socialize. You actually felt depressed. Definitely an unwanted feeling, right? In fact, at that point, you look at the mirror, you look at your body, and you think, it failed me. It just failed me. Because of a small infection, I'm now stuck in bed. But what if I told you that this is actually a very much wanted response of your body? Not just wanted, intentional. It's part of a sick mode program. I envision it like a washing machine that you switch a mode to sick mode. A glimpse at the end, you'll understand that you do need to have the washing machine plugged in. Personal experience. But that actually is part of the story. Because you switch to sick mode, and it's not a very passive mode. It's a very active mode. You've developed fever to stay out from going out to the sun and warm up, afraid of predators. You develop pain so you don't move, so your body can recover. You lost your appetite. You became asocial, asexual, so as not to infect the rest of the people around you, the herd. All of that together is actually a very wanted response. And if we dive in and look at what happens under the hood, under the surface of your body at that point, it turns out that there's a set of molecules that governs these events. And they're anti-inflammatory molecules, but not the kind that you see on the shelf in the pharmacy shelf, like half a room of anti-inflammatories. It's not that kind. These are smart anti-inflammatory molecules that the body generates to facilitate the sick mode. See, what happens is, when you're sick, when you're infected, the immune system is going to attack on your tissues against the pathogens, and the tissues suffer. They suffer. That's the pain. It's very painful. To protect the tissues, the body releases molecules that downplay the part of the injured, uh, inflammatory, sick cells so that the immune system can work harder against the pathogen. And we do that all the time when we're sick. And one of these molecules is actually quite known to the medical community. A rare condition somewhere at the top right upper side of a page in physiology, one of these molecules is lacking. Genetically, some people have less of this one molecule. It has a very long name. Dana, can I give the whole name? Alpha-1 antitrypsin. Okay. Even medical students could catch up on that one. We'll call it alpha-1. It's quicker. Alpha-1. Apparently, there's a genetic condition where there's less of alpha-1 in the body. Those patients, one in 10,000 people, have lung degradation early in life, excessive inflammation in the body, and poor wound healing. They cannot close wounds properly, just because they have less alpha-1 in their blood. For these individuals, pharmaceutical companies have been extracting human alpha-1 from plasma, human plasma, and injecting it to these individuals once a week, slow drip for life, and they're now spared from the lung degradation. Their lungs can recover. They don't have these inflammatory bouts, and they actually return to closed wounds. Turns out you really know how much you need something only when it's gone. This alpha-1 is the center of my research. Today, it is in more than 30 clinical trials worldwide, some in Soroka, some in the country, some in the States, some in Canada, some in South Africa, and there's more, Australia, in people that do have their own alpha-1, people with type 1 diabetes, people with multiple sclerosis, people with inflammatory bowel disease, cystic fibrosis, heart attacks, stroke, apparently, Alpha-1 treatment benefits these individuals. And before I tell you the secret, how it works, 
I have the urge to go back to 2003 to give you some reasoning. Why would it be that I actually study this one anecdotal model of a molecule at the corner of a page? And the reason is that I just got into my postdoctoral fellowship, new lab in Denver, Colorado, at the UC HSC, University of Colorado Health Science Center. Looking at my empty desk, at my swiveling chair, I sat there, and then the pressure starts. You finish training, you have to choose a path, this is your future, give an impact, return to Israel, you need a lot of motivation there. And I'm looking at my empty desk, two weeks go by, <laughs> and I'm still looking at this empty desk, and I look, turn around to look at the window, and there's the Rocky Mountains. It didn't help. And I felt, not everything, I felt a pat on my back, and I turned around, and it was a physician, a resident physician there at UCHAC, holding a big messy pile of papers, articles under his left hand, and a, black, a, a bottle of glass with Alpha One, and he said to me, welcome to Colorado. I work on Alpha One, and all I know is the body makes it when you're infected, and it's anti-inflammatory. So I said, what else do you know about it? True story. He said, we know nothing about it. At that moment, my thoughts were racing. I come from transplant science. You put a graft into a person, and the immune system attacks. I was obsessed with the role of the graft in this rejection. See, any tissue that is stressed, even a tendon, is inflamed. Immediately, the body turns to inflammation. Then the immune system has to interpret that. Even a transplant that you carry from the donor to the recipient is stressed. And I had this huge feeling that this amount of inflammation, this tissue injury inflammation, takes a very strong role in the rejection. And I was hoping that there's some natural anti-inflammatory molecule that the body makes, because otherwise that would mean a lot of anti-inflammatory over-medication, losing the benefits of inflammation and only causing trouble. And then I looked at this physician, and I said, you know what? I grabbed the bottle, and I've since been studying Alpha One. True story. It's in my office. The first thing we found was that when you transplant across models and treat with Alpha One, the immune system apparently has been re-educated to accept the transplants. Why do I say re-educated? Because the immune system kept protecting the transplant even after we stopped therapy. And with that, we had a proof of concept that the immune system isn't always the bad guy. This is what media does. It's not always the bad guy. FDA saw no reason to go to phase one toxicology in healthy people uh, because it's been on the shelf and used in this one in 10,000 for three decades. They fast-tracked us to phase two. The first disease we approached was autoimmune type 1 diabetes. See, under the hood, these kids have a pancreas that's wounded and the immune system keeps assaulting it. What if we could give alpha-1 to these kids and have the immune system diverted around that as if this was an injured tissue that's not the target. To make a long story short, three clinical trials later, one of the biggest ones actually here in Israel, 192 kids treated randomly with either placebo or alpha-1, and they started to make their own insulin. That's pretty amazing. One of the kids... Yeah. One of the kids told her mother, we get these testimonials, mother, stop giving me so much insulin, it makes me feel bad. That's a dream for, for parents with kids with type 1. A call came from Seattle soon after some of the publications came out, and those were a bunch of physicians in Seattle struggling with kids that are a deathbed because they had leukemia and a bone marrow transplant, and the bone marrow attacks the kids. You win the battle, you may lose the war. They called us up, they said, your papers look like they talk about this molecule that doesn't cause damage, but actually allows the immune system to work, which is what they wanted. They gave an intense course of alpha-1 to the first few cases. 
What happened? The kid went off the bed, walked home, cured. Is it possible that humankind doesn't have enough alpha-1? That's tempting to think, right? Well, the secret behind alpha-1 is actually older. It goes way back. We studied it. It's a primitive molecule, so primitive, it actually exists in all the animal kingdom. Animals have different forms of alpha-1, multiple copies of alpha-1. What happens in evolution usually is that genes get copied, replicated, they get mutated now and then, and we discard anything that doesn't provide advantage. Humans only have one gene of alpha-1. One gene, and it's called the orthodox gene. You have to copyright things before you choose, but you have to, it's called the orthodox gene because it's the one version of alpha-1 that's eroded around to just be alpha-1 possibly without a lot of its functions, because humans apparently succeeded in surviving, even though eventually, now and then, they get a small wound. It's not that life-threatening for humans. We took the DNA of human alpha-1 and compared it to the animals, and we actually found that the human version of alpha-1 is so eroded that when we introduced back to it Elements of alpha-1s from nature, from yeah, animals, as far back as these worms and salamandra, this alpha-1 is now much more potent. I'm standing here delivering uh, uh, new news for some of you, but we now have in our hands several prototypes of new alpha-1 that is more than 500 times more potent than the human-extracted plasma alpha-1, it's not a blood product. It's easy to manufacture. It closes wounds faster. And that's BGU Alpha 1 2.0, the new one. <laughs> patented, it's patented. I can see the worries. So we stand humbled in front of a sick human body. And we think to ourselves, it failed. But it didn't. And it doesn't believe in shortcuts. It just doesn't believe in shortcuts. Unlike Waze, <laughs> which is an Israeli invention and very good. Unlike Waze, it's the man with the one leg that you'll ask how to get to your destination best. Ask that man. Ask the sick body. Learn from the wisdom of the sick body. Thank you. <laughs>